All right, we'll go straight on into Ezra chapter 10, um, Ezra chapter 10, and we'll pick up where we left off. This is the 19th week that we have been in Ezra since we started back in chapter 1, verse 1. And by the help of God, I'd like to begin reading in verse number 9, and we'll read down through verse number 17 in Ezra chapter 10. Here the scripture says, Then all the men of Judah and Benjamin gathered themselves together unto Jerusalem within three days. It was the ninth month of the twentieth day of the month, and all the people sat in the street of the house of God, trembling because of this matter and for the great rain. And Ezra the priest stood up. And said unto them, Ye have transgressed and have taken strange wives to increase the trespass of Israel. Now therefore make confession unto the Lord God of your fathers, and do his pleasure, and separate yourselves from the people of the land and from the strange wives. Then all the congregation answered and said with a loud voice, As thou hast said, so must we do. But the people are many. And it is a time of much rain, and we are not able to stand without. Neither is this a work of one day or two, for we are many that have transgressed in this thing. Let now our rulers of all the congregation stand, and let all them which have taken strange wives in our cities come at appointed times, and with them the elders of every city, and the judges thereof, until the fierce wrath of our God for this matter be turned from us. Only Jonathan the son of Asahel and Jehaziah the son of Tikva were employed about this matter, and Meshalem and Shabbatai the Levite helped them. And the children of the captivity did so, and Ezra the priest with certain chief of the fathers after the house of their fathers, and all of them by their names were separated and sat down, in the first day of the tenth month, to examine the matter. And they made an end with all the men that had taken strange wives by the first day of the first month. Back in verse number 9, it says, Then all the men of Judah and Benjamin gathered themselves together unto Jerusalem within three days. It was the ninth month on the twentieth day of the month. And all the people sat in the street of the house of God, trembling because of this matter, and for the great rain. So as far as we can tell, we are still in the seventh year of the reign of Artaxerxes here. Everyone seems to have made this journey within the three days uh, specified time period. And the place where they were gathered was this open square in the front of the temple. And it has been estimated that this particular area in front of the temple was large enough to hold 20,000 men, but we don't really know exactly how many were there at this particular gathering. So this would be the year 458 B.C. And the ninth month that is referenced here correlates to December on our calendar. So this would have been at the height of the rainy season, which would have began in the middle of October. So we have all of these people gathered here at this space at the front of the temple, and they are distressed. Not only are they distressed because of the grave situation concerning the sin, but they're distressed because of the weather. And uh, it's cold and it's wet, so please understand that what we have recorded for us right here in verse number 9 is a very dire, miserable situation. This is a miserable scene. In verse number 9, these people were trembling. It was a dismal atmosphere, but nonetheless, they, they were determined to obey God regardless of the cost. And it's really unfortunate that they had not made that determination years earlier. They could have saved themselves a lot of trouble and a lot of heartache, and that's how it goes when we carry on for long periods of time with unconfessed sin. In our lives, it leads to sorrow upon sorrow. That's why it's important to confess and repent quickly and not carry it around for extended periods of time as these people here in the Word of God did. 
Verse number 10 says, And Ezra the priest stood up and said unto them, Ye have transgressed and have taken strange wives to increase the trespass of Israel. He's speaking very bluntly here, as well he should. He has the sworn support now of the leaders of Israel, and he gives this speech that basically breaks down into two parts. There's the accusation that comes in verse number 10, and the instruction that will come in verse number 11. So Ezra classified the marriages to the foreign idol worshipers as transgressing, literally acting unfaithfully. They have acted unfaithfully. And this is basically the same accusation that the leaders made in the previous chapter, chapter 9, verse number 2, along with the ones who gathered around Ezra in chapter 9, verse number 4. Same thing. It's the same thing that Shechaniah said previously in chapter 10, verse number 2. We talked about that last week. And also the narrator in verse number 6. So all of these... These people view these marriages as unfaithful actions, unfaithful actions. So therefore, the reader who reads the book of Ezra is strongly influenced to come to the same conclusion. You come through chapter 9, you see it's unfaithful action, unfaithful actions. Chapter 10, at least two points before we get to this verse, unfaithful action, unfaithful action. So we're drawn to come to that conclusion. This is a very serious sin, very serious matter. The root wording used to describe this sin is found in several other places in Scripture, but perhaps the most notable is in Joshua chapter 7 in relation to the sin of Achan. In Joshua chapter 7, there is a man by the name of Achan. He fought in the battle of Jericho with Joshua, and God commanded the Israelites to destroy the whole city Because of its horrible sin, only Rahab the harlot uh, and her household was spared because she had hidden the Israelite spies. This victory was not going to be like other victories where the winners come in and they take the spoils. God commanded the Israelites to take nothing from Jericho. Take nothing from this place. Everything in that city was accursed and it was fit for destruction. So God said, don't take the spoils, take nothing. And God even warned them, saying that if anyone took anything out of Jericho, they would make the camp of Israel liable to be destroyed. And everyone listened to the Lord, everyone obeyed the Lord, except for one person, Achan. He stole a beautiful robe, he took some gold, he took some silver, and he hid it in his tent, And just as you might very well conclude, his sin was found out. His sin came to light, as sin often is known to do. It came to light, and God commanded for Achan and his entire family and all of their belongings to be destroyed. Now, that may seem overly harsh to a casual Bible reader in 2024, But please understand that this was something that that affected the entire nation. Ezra used the very same wording to describe these marriages as the Bible used to describe the sin of Achan back in Joshua chapter 7. So this added to the guilt of Israel according to the words of Ezra. That's what it means to increase the trespass of Israel. But now comes the instruction from Ezra in verse number 11. Now therefore make confession unto the Lord God of your fathers and do his pleasure and separate yourselves from the people of the land and from the strange wives. In this one verse we find three imperatives. Three very important imperatives. First of all, make confession unto the Lord. Secondly, do his pleasure. And thirdly, separate yourselves. So this was Ezra's short and sweet sermon. This is basically Ezra reproving these people and calling them to repentance. So the evidence of repentance and their turning back to God would be seen in their separating themselves from ungodly people and in their separating themselves from these foreign idol-worshiping 
wives. So how does this speak to us today? How, how does this speak to us in 2024? What can we, those of us who are sitting here in this place tonight, what can we take away from this? Well, I believe one way it speaks to us today is to remind us not to be in love with the world. As long as we're in love with the world, we could talk about repentance until we're blue in the face. But true repentance will never come until we stop being in love with the world. In order to live out their true character as the people of God, they would have to separate themselves from the peoples of the land. And the root word here for separate is the same root word that's used to speak of the separation of the priest and the Levites for their sacred duties. And it's also used for the separation of the transgressor from the holy community and the transgressor's consignment to judgment. And this is the same sense in which those who failed to assemble themselves together within three days would be placed among the inhabitants of the land and they would lose their possessions. And it's also used in the description of priestly material to mark a difference between the clean and the unclean. So these people were to separate themselves from the people of the land and they were to separate themselves from the strange idol-worshiping wives. And the command to make confession unto the Lord God of your fathers, that has in view to, to give thanks to God and to praise God and to adore God, and to do His pleasure uh, Pleasure is basically to obey His will. It's simply do what God says to do. And then we see a whole congregation give a resounding yes to the words of Ezra. Verse number 12, Then all the congregation answered and said with a loud voice, As thou hast said, so must we do. Yes, Ezra, we must do as you've said. They were convicted of their sins and they considered this their duty to avert the wrath of God, as John Gill put it so eloquently. This was the outworking of Ezra's prayer in chapter 9. But there's some problems with the practical outworking of this decision. Look at verse number 13. But the people are many. And it is a time of much rain, and we are not able to stand without, neither is this a work of one day or two, for we are many that have transgressed in this thing. So they give two basic reasons as to why this problem cannot be solved in one long assembly. First of all, the weather, and secondly, they cite the number of people who were guilty of this thing. In all reality, if this was going to be done, and it was going to be done right, it was going to take some time. And since it was the leaders who brought this problem to Ezra's attention in the first place, the people call on the leaders to help to resolve the problem. So the officials need it to be delegated to represent the assembly as a whole and to make the necessary investigations and actions as to what was to happen at appointed times, which were times that the leaders would determine. Verse 14, Let now our rulers of all the congregation stand and let all them which have taken strange wives in our cities come at appointed times and with them the elders of every city and the judges thereof until the fierce wrath of our God for this matter be turned from us. So these people of Israel, they were allowed to go back to their places of residence as this matter was in the process of being worked out. This was not at all a decision to delay obedience but to allow time for the practical outworking of this great, big, enormous problem. This great, big, enormous mess needed to be sorted out. And they had a genuine desire to reform and to abandon this sin so that God would avert His wrath, so that God would turn away 
his wrath, and it could be that several teams worked in different locations at the same time to bring about the quickest possible conclusions. So these local officials, they would have been best equipped to know the different situations of their offending people who were in their area. This was a very difficult matter. This was a terribly, terribly difficult matter for everyone involved. But uh, so it is when we defect from God and His commandments. So it is when we turn away from God's law and we live in rebellion to it and we abandon the law of God. Our defection from God yields a very bitter, bitter fruit. And that's exactly what we see here in Ezra chapter 10. The bitter fruit of their defection and their rebellion against God. Verse 15, Only Jonathan, the son of Asahel, and Jehaziah, the son of Tikva, were employed about this matter. And Meshulam and Shabbatai, the Levite, helped them. I've had a little trouble with verse 15, and I'll share with you why I say that. We just read the King James Version's translation, which says that, the, that only these people were employed about this matter. Employed, it says, employed about this matter. Every other English translation that I have any confidence in at all from the ESV to the NASB to the New King James, they all say that these people opposed this matter. Honestly, I've not been able to figure out why that translation seems to be so widely accepted. From what I've learned, that stems from an 11th century rabbi. I've looked at the original wording of the verse using the resources that I have available to me, and I haven't been able to find anything very convincing to me that would lead me to believe that verse 15 ought to be understood as these men being in opposition. But there's always a very good chance that this old hillbilly missed something and all the really, really smart people got it right. So if we are to, and I'll come back to that, but if we are to understand this, as they were opposed to what the others had proposed, then there's some ambiguity there too. What exactly did their opposition look like? Did, did they want nothing at all to be done? Or did they want immediate action rather than this lengthy process that had been laid out? Did they want things to be more lenient? Did they want things to be more strict? I don't see the answer in the Scripture. And also, if this is to be understood as these men opposing what the others had proposed, it might have been because they wanted to protect their relatives and their friends because they believed the remedy for the sinful behavior to be too harsh. I thought about that, and lest any of us think such a thing too harsh, because this proposed action would, in fact, result in many, many what we might call broken homes, if we think that's too harsh, we, we may need to look at the situation in its proper perspective. That being, this great sin is not only set against the transgression of God's law, which is more than enough to warrant the proposal, but this great sin should also be set against the ultimate blessing of the entire world that God intended to send through a purified community, and that blessing, of course, being nothing less than His only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, our, our Savior. So when we look at it in that appropriate light, all I could say is thank God this matter was taken as seriously as it was. Amen. Israel had to remain a distinct people in order for the promises concerning the Messiah to be fulfilled. So Ezra and the people of God are taking this seriously and rightly so for that reason. But there's another perspective on the meaning of verse number 15. And actually this one makes sense in my mind, even though it's by far the minority view. And that is that these men, Jonathan and Jehaziah, were the ones who undertook the matter. 
They were the ones who agreed to manage the proposal so that the cases could be regularly brought before the commissioners. Matthew Henry takes that view. But he goes even further to say that these two men were probably the very ones who made the proposal and therefore they would be the fittest ones to carry it out and then two honest Levites join with them to help them and then Guillermo Lorraine who has a commentary on Ezra he cites some evidence to suggest that this could simply mean that these four men stood up and took their responsibility. Thus the King James translation which says they were employed about the matter. So there is some discussion about that perspective as well, such as what he do with the word only at the beginning of the verse and the various ways that that word could be translated. When the smoke settles and the dust clears on Ezra 10, 15, whether these men were in opposition or they were the ones there to see the proposal through, the plan is going to roll on. Verse number 16 and the children of the captivity did so, and Ezra the priest was certain chief of the fathers. After the house of their fathers and all of them by their names were separated and sat down in the first day of the tenth month to examine the matter. And they made an end with all the men that had taken strange wives by the first day of the first month. So we could see here that these proceedings took three months from the first day of the tenth month to the first day of the uh, the the first day of the tenth month to the first day of the first month. So on their calendar this was to Beth to Neeson. On our calendar this would be somewhere around December to March with a little bit of leeway there. Verses eighteen through twenty two give us the cases among the priest Let's read 18 through 22. And among the sons of the priest, there were found that had taken strange wives, namely the sons of Jeshua, the son of Jozadak and his brethren, Masaiah and Eleazar and Jerib and Gedaliah. And they gave their hands that they would put away their wives. And being guilty, they offered a ram of the flock for their trespass. And of the sons of Emmer, Hanan, Hananiah, however you say that, and Zebediah, and the sons of Haram, Masaiah, and Elijah, and Shemaiah, and Jehiel, and Uzziah, and of the sons of Pashur, Eleoni, Masaiah, Ishmael, Nathaniel, Jozebad, and Elisa. And then we have some Levites and singers and a bunch of other folks here. I'll just go ahead and finish reading out the chapter if God will help me. Verse number 23, also of the Levites, Jozebad and Shemaiah and Kaliah, the same as Kalida, Pathahiah, Judah, and Eleazar. Of the singers also, Elias, Hib, and of the porters, Shalom and Telam and Uri, moreover of Israel, the sons of Parash, Remiah and Jeziah and Malchiah and Miamin and Eleazar and Malchijah and Benaiah and of the sons of Elam, Mataniah, Zechariah and Jehiel and Abdi and Jeremoth and Eliah and of the sons of Zatu, Eli Elioni, Elias Hib, Mataniah and Jeremoth and Zabad and Azar. Aziza, and of the sons also of Beba, Johananan, Hananiah, Zabiah, and Athlai, and of the sons of Bani, Meshalem, Malak, and Ad Adiah, and Jasub, and Sheel, and Ramoth, and of the sons of Pahath, Moab, Adna, and Chalal, Baniah, Messiah, Mataniah, Bezaliel, Benu, and Manasseh, and of the sons of Harab, Haram, Eleazar, Ishijah, Malchiah, Shemiah, Shem Shemion, Benjamin, Maluk, and Shemariah, and of the sons of Hashem, Mataniah, Mataha, Zabad, Eliphalet, Jeremiah, Manasseh, 
and Shammai, of the sons of Benai, Mediah, Amram, Uel, Beniah, Bediah, Chela, Beniah, Merimoth, Elias, Heb, Mataniah, Matanay, and Jesu, and Bani, and Benui, and Shemiah, and Sh Shelemiah, and Nathan. Good old Nathan. Thank you for Nathan. <laughs> and Adoniah, Makdab, Makdab, Abiah, I don't remember Ezra chapter 2 being this bad. Oh my goodness. Shashai, Shariah, Azareel, and Shelemiah, Shemariah, Shalom, Amariah, and Joseph. Yes. And of the sons of Nebo, Jalil, Math Mataniah, Zabad, Zabina, Jadu, Joel, Beniah, all these had taken strange wives, and some of them had wives by whom they had children. Whew. <laughs> Praise the good Lord. Amen. So, and that's the ending of Ezra. Seems like a very abrupt ending, doesn't it? There's no scene of great joy here at the end of the book. And the account seems to just fizzle out rather than to come to a decisive conclusion. In fact, when we get into Nehemiah, we're going to see that this sin of intermarriage with foreign idol-worshipping wives is still a problem. Still going to be a problem on over in the book of Nehemiah. Remember, Ezra and Nehemiah is one book. It's one work in the Hebrew Bible, not two books. So with that in mind, the very next thing that the reader is going to read is that the returnees to Jerusalem are in great affliction and great reproach, and we find that the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and the gates are burned with fire. In Nehemiah chapter 1, verse number 3. That's the very next thing that the reader is going to read. So you probably knew that the book of Nehemiah had something to do with the rebuilding of a wall. You probably knew that. But did you consider that the wall in Nehemiah is directly related to these intermarriages with foreign wives? I can assure you for Nehemiah, the rebuilding of that wall had much to do with the shutting out of foreign influences. So as we've come to the book of Ezra, I'm not telling you that there was no reform that took place. I'm not saying that. The story clarified the people of Israel as a purified community separated from foreign contaminations. But I think you'll find out as is often the case with Israel in the Old Testament, the reform was short-lived. The Jews had very short memories. They were, in fact, the very human component of the house of God. But we've seen a man in Ezra who did not appeal to the Persian king. He didn't even use any of the sweeping power and authority that the king had granted to him, but he did pray. He prayed to God, and he did teach and uphold the law of God, and that was what was applied to the people rather than a king's decree. So this whole matter of putting away these foreign idol-worshipping wives was a very costly, a very heart-wrenching experience. And for you and I today who live after the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and his death, and his burial, and his resurrection, you and I who live today with the full revelation of God's word, something that Ezra did not have, but you and I have it. We have the full revelation of God's word. We have a key passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 that instructs you and I on how we are to handle marriages with unbelieving spouses. 
I'm going to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, way on over in the New Testament, beginning in verse number 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 12. I'm going to read through verse number 15. Here it says, But to the rest speak I, not the Lord, if any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath not an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now they are holy. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. And don't let that part throw you where he says, I speak, but not the Lord. This is the Lord's word. The Lord is speaking through here. This is God's inspired word. Every word in this book is God speaking to us. So there's a difference in the situation that Ezra faced when we, uh, than, than what we face in our day and time. This does not mean that Ezra chapter 10 has no application for us today. It does not mean that. Not at all. God wants us to take marriage so seriously that we get it right and not enter into a marriage with someone who does not believe in God and not to enter into a marriage with someone who does not have faith in God. The problem toward the end of the book of Ezra has much to do with unfaithfulness and how to fix it. And there's a lot of debate out there as to whether or not the people sought to reform themselves or did Ezra bring about the reform? One thing I could say for certain is there's no amount of self-reform that we could ever engage in that is going to merit our right standing before God. We, just, we, need, the, we need the perfect righteousness of Christ imputed to our accounts. That's what we need. Nothing less than that is going to avail. And after we're saved, we're told in the Scripture how we are to live and how we need to amend our lives to coincide with the Word of God, but we do that because we love Him and we have a desire for God to be glorified, not that we somehow can save ourselves or keep ourselves saved. But the problem of unfaithfulness came to fruition in the life and the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. What do I mean when I say that? Well, He's the one who came to save unfaithful sinners. He's the one who did that. He's the one who takes the unfaithful and he works faithfulness into their hearts and lives. He's the one who came to heal the ultimate separation. And that is the separation of sinners from a holy God. And it's through the blood of Christ and faith in his work that we have the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. And remember this, there's power in prayer and there's power in fasting but it must be done from the heart of a person who is trusting in God and believing God's Word. Don't let it be just a show. Don't let it be just a show. There's warnings in Scripture against that. Jesus taught His disciples to pray humbly to the Father, and He opened the way for every believer to draw near to God with confidence and faith and full assurance and that applies to you if you know the Lord in a saving way here tonight. And if you don't know the Lord in a saving way, you must repent and believe the gospel. You must trust in His gracious promises. And once you've come to Him in faith and repentance, ask Him to strengthen you and to give you grace every step of the way. And you'll find that He is a perfect God. And Jesus Christ is a perfect and a faithful Savior. And that's concludes the book of Ezra as far as this study uh, is concerned. So God bless you. Thank you for your attention for these last 19 weeks. And uh, we're going to take a two-week break, as we said, and start Nehemiah on November the 13th. And I invite you to pray with